I think we are all familiar with such a commercial buck converter circuit. As an example, you could simply supply 12 volts to its inputs, connect the multimeter to its outputs, and then use the given potentiometer to adjust the output voltage to 5 volts. Therefore you could say that a buck converter is a DC to DC converter, which can step down voltages. And best of all, it can do that job with a high efficiency, which was around 79% in my example here. If we now take a look at the simplified circuit diagram of such a converter, then we can see that it only requires a switch like a MOSFET, a diode, a coil and a capacitor to build it. That is why I also created one during a previous video of mine, with the help of the LM2576 simple switch IC from Texas Instruments. I use this IC because it combines a MOSFET switch with the required feedback control system, and thus building up the buck converter circuit only required for additional passive components. For me, the coil selection was the hardest part though, because there exist 100 microenvy coils with different shapes, sizes and with different core materials. And I was never 100% sure which coil would be the best for the job. To solve this problem, the Word Electronic ISOS group sent me a buck converter learning kit, which utilizes different kinds of coils. So in this video, we will not only find out how to calculate the inductance for such a buck converter, but we will also find out how, for example, the size, core material and temperature influence our utilized coils. Let's get started. This video is sponsored by the Word Electronic ISOS Group. Before supplying the learning kit board with current, we have to figure out what kind of function the coil fulfills in the buck converter circuit. To do that, we firstly hook up 12 volts to our simplified circuit diagram and close the switch. Now current flows from our voltage source through the coil, through the load and back to the source. But as soon as current started flowing through the coil, it simultaneously built up a magnetic field, which in turn induced the voltage into the coil itself, and thus created an opposing current, which is the reason why the original current through the coil can only rise slowly. While the current is now slowly rising in a relatively linear fashion, the voltage across the coil is corresponding to this equation pretty much constant and also opposite in comparison to the input voltage. That means the output voltage equals the input voltage reduced by the voltage across the coil, which therefore means that we successfully step down the voltage at the outputs. Of course, we cannot keep the switch closed forever, because the stored energy of the coil in the form of the magnetic fields will at some point reach its maximum. This state is called magnetic saturation, in which a constant current flows that is only limited by the resistance of the windings of the coil, if we neglect the load resistance or rather nearly short it. There also does no longer exist a noticeable voltage across the coil, and thus the output voltage does more or less equal the input voltage. To get the desired output voltage though, we have to open the switch at the right time, which would lead to an abrupt breakdown of the current if there wouldn't exist the inductive properties of the coil. So during that switch opening moment, the coil uses its stored energy in order to push a current through the loads and the diodes, which once again leads to relatively linear, this time decrease of the current value. Because of this current, we got a voltage across the coil with reverse polarity in comparison to before, which reduced by the diode voltage equals the output voltage. Now the current through the coil drops longer or shorter before the switch gets once again closed, depending on how much energy is required at the outputs. <laughs> 
And because of the continuous repeating of the two switch states, we create such a square wave signal for the switch. The proportion between the on time of the switch and the cycle duration equals the so called duty cycle. And the altering of the duty cycle depending on the output current is called pulse width modulation, which can reach a maximum of 1, so 100%. The higher this value becomes, the more energy is being stored in the coil. And also the output voltage gets closer to the input voltage. I think due to this explanation of the functional principle of a buck converter, it should be clear that the inductance value depends on a whole lot of different factors. Like the input voltage, the occurring resistances, the load current, the output voltage, the duty cycle, the switch frequency and even the ripple current. So you can either use this relatively precise formula to calculate the inductance value or make your life easier by simply following the recommendation of the IC's datasheet. At this point some of you might think, well I will just use a big inductance because it can store more energy and thus the converter should be able to output more power. And when we have a look at different commercial buck converters, then it seems like this theory is somehow correct. But in order to learn more about how to properly select a coil, let's have a look at the learning kit board, which uses three different coils for its first buck converter circuit. One of them features an inductance of 100 microhenry and two of them an inductance of 68 microhenry. So after hooking up 12 volt power to the board and connecting a constant load circuit to its outputs, I had a look at the voltage and current wave of each coil on the oscilloscope. And even though the 100 microhenry coil should be able to store the most energy, I did not like its current flow with an output current above 1.2 amps in comparison to the current flow of the second coil. The reason for that is that the 100 microhenry coil uses ferrite as a core material, while the second coil uses iron powder. The consequence is that the inductance of the first coil will drastically decrease at a certain DC current value, because the material reaches its magnetic saturation region, while the inductance of the second coil will only decrease relatively constant across a wider current range. Therefore you can see that at a similar coil size, the choice of the core material can be more important than the actual inductance value. And you should always have a look at the magnetic saturation current and not exceed it. With that being said, we can move on to the second buck converter circuit, which coincidentally uses a big and a small coil with the exact same inductance value of 10 microhenry. Both of them fulfill their job in the buck converter circuits without a problem. But it is not a surprise that the physical smaller coil starts causing problems at higher output currents before the bigger coil does. One of the reasons is that the smaller coil reaches its magnetic saturation earlier and thus its inductance gets decreased. But more important in this case is that the temperature of the small coil increases up to 80 degrees celsius at a current flow of 4 amps while the bigger coil would need 13 amps to reach the same temperature. The reason is simple. In order to achieve a certain inductance value, you need a certain number of windings. This number is of course bigger for a smaller coil in comparison to a bigger coil, built with the same core material. And to achieve this number of windings for the smaller coil, we also have to use a way thinner enamel copper wire while the bigger coil can use a thicker wire. Practically speaking, that means that our smaller coil features an almost 9 times bigger resistance in comparison to the bigger coil, and thus it produces 9 times more power losses, which need to get dissipated as heat. But because the smaller coil also features less surface area to dissipate the heat, we can easily slip into a region in which the winding isolation can melt and thus destroy the coil. Of course, there are also other factors which influence the coil selection, 
And if you're interested in learning more about them, then I would highly recommend checking out the experiment book that came with the learning kits, which tells you pretty much everything you need to know about coils. Another assistance tool to select the right coil would be the Red Expert tool, which can conduct the simulation of different inductances in a circuit. But nevertheless, I hope that I was able to give you a small insight into the world of coils, and that you now understand that the inductance value is not the only important property. There is for example also the coil resistance and the magnetic saturation current. And most of the time, a small look into the datasheet of a coil can be very helpful. Of course, you can also visit the Word Electronic ISOS Group website to get more information about coils, or to order them since they come with very detailed datasheets, which for example eBay sellers do not offer in 99% of the cases. As always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe and hitting the notification bell. Stay creative and I will see you next time.